Cleveland, Thursday, July 17th, next summer at the Romo Fijo. You're going to get these tickets from me all week before they go on sale. These are not on sale until Friday morning at 10 a.m. Go to rocketmortgagefieldhouse.com for that. They are pointing out, the guys in Ghost, that this will be a phone-free experience. One of those shows are going to take your phone and put it in the yonder bag, and you can have it when the whole thing is over. So Ghost, fans want to see them next summer, July 17th at the Romo Fijo. Caller 10, these are yours. Get my first pair this week. Good luck. 216-578-1007 or 800-348-1007. Clevelanders are damn proud of their city. Cleveland! But come on, you were born here. He moved here. This is a man that has endured real torture in a foreign setting. So who's the real hero? I would hope people would listen to our heroes. Alan Cox. On 100.7 WMMS. Oh, all those ghost fans going to have their undies in a twist I might next go to summer. That. What's that? I might go to that. Get off my phone for a few hours, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just an opportunity to be in the moment. Your Cleveland Cavaliers not at the Romo Fijo tonight. Uh, they're playing the Knicks in New York. They have hosed down and disinfected Madison Square Garden. And uh, the Knicks will host them tonight. That is a 7.30 tip-off. You'll get your pregame coverage starting tonight at uh, 7 o'clock here on MMS. Uh, Cavs, uh, number two right now, 3-0. and Only the Boston Celtics are also undefeated. So they're tied for first. Tied for first. And, uh, sorry, Lakers and Thunder, too. But I was looking at the East, East Coast. So, uh, Cavs, Knicks tonight, 7.30 tip-off uh, here on your FM home for Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, Mary, you were going into something when I had to go to a break. I was just going to say that being in New York now, and it's a very liberal city overall, and then having Brooklyn, which is arguably one of, if not the most liberal cities in the country, doing comedy in Brooklyn is impossible. Like, if you are not saying every trigger word that they want to hear, they are upset. They are aggravated. I've had people talk to me about being insensitive after shows. I'm not a controversial comic. And I I understand that there are crybabies on both sides fully. But if we're just talking in the sense of stand-up comedy, I feel like liberal audiences are way, way less fun. Well, Brooklyn seems like a place where if you're doing anything as a comic, you're probably only playing to those crowds. Like There's you people do, who don't leave Brooklyn. That's like what I'm saying. That only perform in Brooklyn that's because what, it's the only place it'll play. That's what I'm saying. You can do the road. You can do other stuff. So if people want to stay under the dome and do the material that they're doing, but it's not going to fly outside of Brooklyn. Right. It's just- But um, there are plenty of snowflakes to go around, by the way. Right. No, I agree. Yeah. And yeah. If, if I were to do my material at a uh, for a church group, they'd be like, hey, this guy doesn't seem to like God all that much. <laughs> they didn't vet you very well. Yeah. I'm not saying there's not sensitive people, and, you know, I've, I've done shows in, for that kind of crowd, and it can be, like you said, where they, they, they seem, they're so uptight about it that they don't want to let anything slide. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm just very... Offended by, or they're they're sensitive, and that's fine. So there's comedians for them, and there's there's so much comedy out there that I that's why I think it's weird to get offended by things because you can just find something that you do like. Right. I was one of the think pieces I was reading was about like why is comedy turning conservative, and I'm like it's not. There's just so much of it now that you can find what you like and what you don't. There's so much comedy. And that it's like there's no and when people you can look still at find it, plenty of people doing stuff that you're gonna like. And when people look at it through that lens. So when I go on the road with Chad Daniels and I think Dan Cummins is, is a, a good example of another comic like this who has just re- like the most like down the middle fans. Yeah. And those are my favorite because they look at everything as a joke first, and then they're like, 
Well, there might be something a little upsetting about that, but overall, they're just they they're there for the humor and they go on the ride with you. So I like an audience that's willing to go on the ride and look at the uh, take the comedy through the lens of comedy and not oh, they just said this one thing that upset me, so now everything is wrong. Well, because the reason that people, and it's true of every single one of us, the reason something makes you uncomfortable is because in your brain you go, I didn't think I would laugh at that, but here I am laughing at that, right? Laughter is involuntary. Or you hear other people laughing at it and you go, why are they laughing? I don't like that. And then there's also people that they don't get the jokes and that makes them feel dumb and so they get angry. Then there's a million different reasons that people get offended or upset at comedy. Which is why just, you might as yeah. well just go full tilt boogie. Yeah. You might as well just go, here it is. Like it or bite it. Mm-hmm. Like you can do this Friday. Mm. And we're get we're what's it? What's this Friday? Uh my new album, We're Getting Famous, is available. Oh yeah. Just the audio version. The video is gonna be out later this year. Right. Bill Square dot com. Alan Tell Marriott isn't canceling its consequence. No, there's a difference. You can't hold you can... a fake head of, this is this person's text, okay. you can't hold a fake head of a sitting president, Kathy Griffin, not expect consequences. You can't go on a racist diatribe on a black woman like Roseanne and not expect consequences. No, no, no. I fully agree with all of that. Yeah. But I'm talking about lesser offenses. Like when people, and it's it's calmed down in the last couple of years, but when people, the whole Karen movement, when a lady flips you off in traffic and you hunt her down, find her job, email her boss and try to get her fired- I mean, that's crazy. That's insane. And those weren't Republicans doing that. Right. There's a words are violence crowd. Yes. Who are too much in their own heads or they're still on campus. Or they're chronically online. Yeah. There's a lot of bubbles people can live in. You know, we talk about information silos, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who don't think they're in either one. But most of us are. Just by virtue of what our values inherently are. And some people change. You know, they run a lot of these commercials. We've run them here. They're a lot on television, this Sherrod Brown-Bernie Moreno race, which is real neck and neck, too. Um, I don't think more money has been put into a state Senate race than that one in Ohio. Across the country, I think that's the one that has had the most money put into it. And, listen, I'm a Sherrod Brown voter, but... They run a lot of these commercials. Oh, you're going to vote for Sherrod Brown? He wants your dog to be a gay trans immigrant. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I want my dog to be a gay trans immigrant. She's had a pretty good life. Um, but they're, run, they're very like proud of these, um, you know, I'm a Republican, but I'm voting for Sherrod Brown. You get these people out in the middle of Trumbull County or whatever, and they put them on camera, and they go, I'm voting for the person, not the party, and that's all great, but I guarantee T you each one of those people is also voting for Donald Trump. So it's, I get what they're doing. They're like, hey, this guy can bring people together. I'm sure there's all kinds of uh, people who lean right who might vote for Sherrod Brown at the Senate level. But each and every one of them is also going to vote for Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. I have a, so, new, I have a new chunk of material about being a, the, the phrase I've used is first generation liberal. Where I'm the first one in my family who's ever even cross the barrier. Right. You know what I mean? And I've done this material in New York City, in Arkansas, North Carolina, and Ohio. Those are the four places I've done it. And the reactions in the different parts of the country are insane because I am the differences. very- Yeah, I'm very in the middle of the, like from the standpoint of the jokes, I'm like, hey, I'm like a half a step to the left. And let me explain to you why I made this choice kind of a thing. In New York, one I have a vagina. Oh yeah, uh, my body. How about that? Let's start there. No, in New York, it's too easy. It's a tee up because when I say I'm a Democrat, it is a insane applause and woohoo, good for you, girl. You made the right choice. They're already rolling out the red carpet already, and it's a little bit more work when I do it in like when I did it in Arkansas or North Carolina. But at the end of the day, the people who are coming up after me are coming up to me after the shows. The response I'm getting from people who are Republicans is, to me, more endearing because they're coming up and they're like, hey, I really like the way that you put that stuff. Or like they'll joke and be like, it's not too late for you to come back or whatever, whatever. Whereas it feels like a more mob mentality when the liberal people are like, oh, you made the switch. Amazing. Good for you. And I'm like, hold on. Let me explain. You know, and I don't know. That's just (laughs) you made the switch. 
I'm serious that it's like from the second I say Democrat, they're like, yeah, I'm so I'm like, just for a second, Guys, let's relax. You know? that. Remember Anthony Weiner? That guy was a Democrat. He's not a good dude. There's plenty of people on that side who are, you know, got their problems. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah, but the Tony Hinchcliffe thing, I'm kind of like, okay, this guy's trying to get in front of a lot of people. He's got nothing to lose. Nothing. You think he cares if people are low-key trying to um, insult him? You know, This guy's a comedian? I've never heard of him. A lot of people have. A lot of people have. I don't know about the people, people at, at Madison Square Garden. But. trying to get on his podcast, and, you know, as soon as I... You know, you, you saw the headlines, and you're like, oh, in text, that looks bad. But then when you hear him deliver the joke, you're like, oh, it's obviously a joke. Right. So it's it's one of those things where, yes, there's people that are going to be upset about it. But I don't. Th- I think this is just people were bored on a Sunday, and this big thing was happening. They're like, well, let's, let's talk about this because – it's I don't also think it's not gonna, easy. To, I don't. I think it's going to sway anybody one way or the it's other. It's also not easy to get. They pull a huge crowd there for that rally, and it ain't easy to get into the city. We drove to Jersey for the wedding this weekend, but we were the only ones who drove because our friends are coming from San Francisco and Denver and blah blah blah. One of our friends, a couple of them flew out of Newark, but one of our friends who was flying out of LaGuardia, I think, or Kennedy, one of the two, Texted us. We were like in the Poconos by the time she texted. She's like, oh, my God, that apparently I didn't know there was a Trump rally until yesterday afternoon when she texted and was like, oh, my God, the traffic because of this thing at Madison Square Garden is bananas. The ripple effects of that traffic. I'm like, that's first I heard of it. I didn't know. We were in Jersey the whole time, but I mean, she had to go in there and, and fly out. Alan, when Trump was shot, I commented on a friend's Facebook post. If you don't succeed. Somebody saw it, figured out where I worked, emailed my boss, said they shouldn't hire people who advocate gun violence. Now, my boss thought it was kooky, but she had to call me and talk about it and tell me to take it down. I don't like those kind of posts either, right? Um, Where people go, you missed, or I don't know. It's weird. Alan, please listen to any of the podcasts Trump has been on before you continue to bash him relentlessly. It seems like all you do is listen to mainstream media, which at this point is literally Democratic propaganda. Again, I don't know what you're defending at this point. Trump is a moron and a fascist and a traitor. So I don't know. I don't know what you're defending. People who talk to me like this, the Trump fans. Do whatever you're going to do. You know, in Portland, in Vancouver, Washington, this is going to be no big shop up there in the Pacific Northwest, but this is kind of what we can expect from the MAGA folks is they're dropping matches into ballot boxes. The ballot drop boxes where people can drop their ballots, early voting, right? Portland doesn't have to take a, you, you doesn't take you long to figure out why they're doing it there. Um, so they're destroying hundreds of ballots in these drop boxes by setting the contents on fire. In there or ballots or whatever it is. Because, you know, again, that to me falls very much in line with people who are conservative and consider themselves to be Christians because they're very, very insecure about their beliefs. They're constantly screaming to you about God. People are hip to God. Like, they know what he's about, like they know what Trump's about. And so... He likes getting 14-year-old girls pregnant. But but there's also, but there's a lot of insecurity in that, too. There's a lot of, like, man, I don't know why you're so insecure about some omniscient being that you believe in. No, I'm talking about God, not Trump. Um, <laughs> they they think of them in very much the same terms. So no big shock that in the Pacific Northwest of this country, now granted a couple of isolated incidents, but these are the kinds of things that we can expect. I don't know why in my brain I still think that the election is so far away. It's next week. It's next week. Yeah. yeah. I early voted when I was home last week. Yeah. For Trump. For Trump. Mm-hmm. Didn't I tell you guys that? I switched sides, but I went back. <laughs> <laughs> I went back. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, it's like our former co-worker, Geraldo Rivera, is getting a lot of coverage today, too, because he got really upset and incensed um, at, I guess, the Puerto Rican jokes or something. I don't know if he's Puerto Rican, but, you know, he's like, oh, you Latino voters, you're voting against your own self-respect. It's like, this is not new information. Now that Geraldo Rivera is, maybe nobody's been talking about him for a minute and he wanted to get some column inches, but it's like, dude... This is, none of this is new information. You're not going to sell me on this undecided voter myth. I don't I buy it. I agree with you on that. I don't buy it. To me, undecided voter means they don't know if they're going to vote. That's what I, yes. That's what I mean. That's when all I say, I'm saying. Yeah, that, undecided. Anyone who's going to vote knows exactly who they're voting for. Well, and that's what I, but the they, point. They, but they, they frame undecided voters as, I just don't know. I need to do I more do research. More research you know, the, and a lot of it, in. granted, I'm I, I'm not going to piss on kids because whatever, but a lot of Good. them are like people on campus who are like, I'll figure it out as I'm driving over. Will you? I mean, your vote counts exactly as much as mine. So I guess the fact that you're going to engage in the process is good, but um, you're not going to sell me on undecided voters. The, I, There's no reasonable person. Who goes, I just don't know. Don't know. The point I was making with Trump doing all these, you know, male podcasts is that that is the undecided voter they're going for. Young men who probably weren't going to vote to begin with. But if we can portray Trump in a two hour time span as kind of a cool, goofy human being, that's going to sway them to decide just to go out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, again, when the Trumpers text me, I'm like, I don't know what you're defending. Well, what I like to do is I like to look at every... No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't look at every angle and then figure... You don't. You have your angle. I mean... He's I've, your guy. I've admitted cop to, to being... I just don't know why... Because there's people who really cop to it, right? I sent you guys the photo. I was in traffic and the guy right next to me in like a, you know, 85 Corolla... Is just the thing is covered with giant Trump flags. Mm-hmm. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. Fine, fine. But that's a guy who cops to it, you know? If you're on the left and you really don't like all the screaming and the flags, it is all nonsense. But those people cop to it. The reason people are so nervous on the left is because they're worried there are all these quiet Trump voters. The people who go, well, I could never tell someone that I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. There were probably a lot of quiet Kamala Harris voters, too. But who knows? Things a week away. But the the Tony Hinchcliffe thing, that's all anybody's talking about today. And it's largely focused on him. There was also a guy with a crucifix who called Kamala Harris the Antichrist and, and another guy who's like, Democrats are demons who need to be burned back to hell. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's very, very strange. It has been strange. For the better part of eight or nine years. See, doesn't, very, very strange. Doesn't that type of person seem like they'd take a joke better? Someone who wants to burn a Democrat back to hell. That doesn't seem like. No, because they're deadly serious. I mean, I listen, know, there I'm are joking. a million to to quote uh, uh, G Dub, uh, G H Dub. There are a thousand points of light, right? There are different people who fall across every part of the spectrum, and so. It's really, really, that's why when you read these articles, they say, hey, do yourself a favor and ignore the daily polling articles because nobody knows anything. Nobody will know anything until after the election. You're not going to know night of when Trump says he won. I mean, he'll say he won immediately. Fine. We know that. That's not even controversial. We know that. But when we figure out what really happened, that's when we'll know what happened. Until then, nobody knows anything can imagine trying to make your living as a political consultant right now we're like well this and uh, two points in michigan and nobody knows anything because the person on the phone first of all you're talking to people on the phone and a lot of them probably lying to you on both sides they're like i'm not gonna tell you or yes of course this is the person that i'm so i don't know but for on the comedy perspective you got to do you i gotta take a break um, oh, Sullivan King. This guy's wild. We played him on two hours to midnight. Sullivan King is a guy who uh, dabbles uh, in as much electronic.